Free Speech Friday time here on the platform with me, Sean Plunkett, and special, invited, smart, incisive guests. And who we got uh, today? Well, because she's done such sterling work all this week and I've loved listening to her as she's done some film spots for Michael, um, my good mate uh, from over in the rapper, Tina Nixon. G'day, Tina. How are you? Good morning. Uh, you're back home? You've had a hectic week? Yeah, I... Yeah, it has been. Yep, I'm home. All right, and the man, the host with the most, and I just popped in to say good day and see his new place open in Auckland on Tuesday, and the guy sits me down and says, have some Patagonian toothfish, or Patagonian fish, I think he's got to say it. Maybe we had a little drop of champagne and some amazing Wagyu beef at his new venue in Auckland, uh, which is HQ2, as I like to think of it. Um, Leo Malloy, mayoral candidate, um, Publican, uh, <laughs> entrepreneur. How are you, Leo? Could not be better, Sean. And, and a big hi to my very dear friend Tina Nixon, longtime fan of Tina. All right, know Tina quite well. Of course, she flattered with my sister for some time. So it's a little family reunion going on. It's right a here tiny now. country, isn't it? It's a tiny <laughs> it's a country. Great. Don't you just love group great? <laughs> can, I, can I tell you something, Sean? You be careful she doesn't repurpose you one day. She'll turn you into a lovely line of sausages and a bit of, like, KFC and a nice bit of fried liver to flash off in the pan. Because she does repurpose a lot of living I beans. don't want to know, all right? I don't want to know your past. Let the past stay in the past, guys. Look, I want to start with something kind of serious. And Tina, geez, you did some interesting stuff on this week. And look, as I've said mm. today, I, I think a lot of the stuff about the gang crime wave and the hundreds of dead bodies is, I'm sorry, it's conspiracy theory nut job stuff and I don't see any evidence as a journalist. But one thing that is there in the wake of this uh, cyclone for all to see is forestry slash. Taking yeah. out bridges that weren't designed to handle it and just everywhere you see it and the destruction it has caused and the government's now got an inquiry, Tina. That is the one thing we know is causing problems, eh? Absolutely, and it was really good to see them appoint some decent people to the inquiry. Um, Bill Bayfield is, um, I'm a bit of a fangirl um, of, of Bill. He's been a public servant for a long time, but everything that he does, he does really, really well. He's incredibly pragmatic. Um, and is really, really good at engaging people. And Hickey Parada is no-nonsense sort of a chick too, so um, I think that'll go really well. Um, I, the problem I have, though, is, is, I mean, it's okay dealing with the slash, and it's a big issue, but there is also the issue of hills that have been planted in, in grass that are, are literally falling around, uh, falling down, mm. and we've seen that in Tutera. Um, and, and, this, and there is other issues well around how we're managing um, rivers and planting willows that are not deep rooted and, yeah. and, and some of the slashes, those as well. So if we just look at slash, we're not going to solve the problem. Yeah. We will only solve part of it. Yeah. And it's a bit of a knee jerk reaction. And don't get me wrong, I think slash is, is yeah. uh, if I was the forestry industry at the moment, yeah. I'd be Tina, would you think, agree with me? We don't actually have any hard evidence on a crime wave yet. Or on, yeah, no, on I disagree mass with casualties. you entirely. We had no. I had two guests on with me this week, and both of them raised the issue unsolicited. Okay, and Tina, both they both raised. They and, both... they and they no, and they were both victims. So they both had businesses that had been affected, and they both had family members that have been affected. And had uh, they reported those have... things to police? Yes, they had, and no, one of them couldn't because they didn't have a phone. Well, then how could they and tell anyone else about it if they couldn't, uh, about their crime? They were they telling didn't... us on the air about it. They, they said there's a fr there was a level of frustration because they couldn't contact the One person, okay. No, and there's not one person, there was two. And oh, that, two, that's, that's not a crime oh, Hang on, they were the two, there was, now hang on, you get, you, you, you're missing the point here and you've sort of touched on it. One of the things is, is there is stuff going on. There has been a level of underreporting because of the communication difficulties. Kirsten Wise raised that issue as well. And there is also a, a palpable fear in the community because all they're hearing is police yeah. sirens and helicopters overhead. So there, there will be an element of, put, of putting together two and two and making um, five. Yeah. Um, but I think you will find that, that, and there's another article on another media station this morning about people who are in the um, Pukitapu area who have uh, who have getting um, people coming up their drives and doing the, the rec recce's and stuff. So, yes, there is a crime. What the, what the government should have done is what they did in Christchurch and chuck some police in there really fast and probably the defence to make people yep. feel safe. Okay, all right. 
Are you saying it's a feeling? It is. It says much the feeling. Or, or, you, you think it's real. In the absence of evidence, we've also got to recognise the feeling, so, which is kind of what David Sim was saying. Leo, what is from you from an Auckland, from, you know, your plushy uh, viaduct front bar in Auckland where you said it wasn't going to be a big deal and you got a kicking on social media for that? Well, you didn't. You just said right now it's not a big deal. Uh, do you believe that there's a gang crime wave underway in, in, in Hawke's Bay and in, in flood-affected areas? Oh, look, and, and the, I'm not there. I was in Havelock North last week, obviously, but uh, no, I have no evidence to support such a thing, and, and Tina's on the ground there, so I'm going to say, and I know Mitch is, Mark Mitchell's going down today, so I'll be keen to hear what he says. But, yeah, I'm in a position where I wouldn't be able to give you an informed comment yeah. on that. I mean, I do want to talk about Slash, though, if you don't mind, because yep. there's issues, and it conflates a wee bit with Maureen Pugh, I know we're going to discuss later. You might want to discuss it now, it's up to you. Well, the Green Party can't have it both ways. Either you can clean up the slash and you can burn it or use it to carve wood or make furniture out of, or you leave it there. And if you leave it there, you have to deal with the consequences. So forestry is becoming a very complex issue in New Zealand. ETS taking over good productive land to, to carbon credits and the slash, which is obviously forestry to, to cultivate, viticulture, but what do they call it? The silviculture. Yeah. Um, but you can't have it both ways. You've got to make a decision how you're going to manage it. And this is where the Green Party has to step up and own what's happened here and say, yeah. hey, we've got it wrong. Let's reverse that. Let's allow them or make the forestry companies clean it up and let's use it more productively. Let's allow, allow people to harvest forestry from Cat 5 uh, dock land on the west coast or from up around the Gisborne area. But it's very, very sad what's happened down in, in Hawke's Bay, Napier, Gisborne area. You know, what can you say? I mean, you're right. In Auckland, we were lucky we escaped. But I think my comment was the calm before the storm. Yeah. Um, but it went around the outside of us as those cyclones like Bowler and Berriby do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a tragedy for the country and it's going to require a major revisit to a lot of our strategies yeah. from forestry to building. It's going, we have to have a very serious look at this country. Well, guys, today. I think David Seymour was interesting this morning and he's trying to carve out a political niche here in an election year, but he said, it is time to stop arguing about why climate change might be happening or have been deluded enough to think here in New Zealand we can in any way stop or influence it and simply look to ourselves and say we're going to have to deal with the possibility of it and with weather events like that. I actually think that's a really pragmatic approach. Mm. Do you reckon, Tina, that's the way to go? Absolutely, and it's the, it's the difference between mitigation and adaptation, and um, Hooten's actually got a bloody good column on it um, today in the Herald, exactly that. You know, it's time to, it's time to be sensible about this, and mitigation's not going to do any good it's not going to save the planet, um, but adaptation is going to give us the best chance to be able to cope with what's coming. Mm. Mm. Extreme Leo? weather events, Sean. Extreme weather events, we have to mitigate them because it's a classic inversion. I know Tina's married to a vet, lucky Tina. But um, in the veterinary yep. world, you get taught that you deal with the cause, not the symptoms. In this instance here, we have to deal with the symptoms, not the cause. We've got to invert at 180 degrees. We can't control the cause. The cause is global. What we can control is the symptoms. And the symptoms, you've seen an example of them yeah. last week. Yeah. And that's what we can do. And, and, and it seems to on. me that arguing over the cause or believing we can change the cause, poor old Mooring Pew, uh, she fell foul of that today. Basically, she got sent off to the re-education gulag, didn't she, by, by her leader... Well, she just shows that she's a piss poor politician. Even if she had extreme views on it, um, she just she just she should have just shut a trap. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. And I sort of get where she's coming from, but I I just thought, why would you say that? I mean, it was just like just you should have just walked on. Because you believed it, Tina. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know it's a unique concept for you, but you know What's sometimes that? people say what they believe. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and I've got to say, I thought that in a free speech kind of way, Luxon acted like a petulant middle manager. Uh, I have to say here that I think Maureen was caught in the headlights a bit, a bit of naivety there in front yeah. of the microphone and the camera, and she did reverse the truck up fairly quickly. But I do agree with you about Chris Luxon. I don't think that was his finest hour, that re-education process. Yeah. I think what he should have said is she is clearly manifestly wrong and she has an obligation to get it yeah. right. Well, I disagree with her and the party disagrees with her. However, <laughs> we're a party that's tolerant of free speech in the individual. And I will leave her to reflect on how she might respond to that. That would be the cool way to have done it, in my humble opinion. And I don't lead a political party. Um, I want to ask you, though, about Luxon, and, of course, the Labour trolls and everyone are feeding the Nicola Willis Chris Bishop, and they're woker than he is by 100 miles, um, that they're going to coo on him and he's been caught napping by um, the blokism rather than the wokism of Chris Hipkins. 
Would you two guys agree that Hipkins and this very carefully staged managed transition of power has changed the political landscape and maybe the odds on the election outcome? Who's ranking first, Tina, you or me? <laughs> you, you go first. <laughs> OK, so I think that you're seeing here, obviously um, Hipkins got a bump. That's natural, and it yeah. wasn't out of proportion with other leader changes. Um, it does prove one thing, that Jacinda wasn't the goddess who thought yeah. he was. Yeah. But, and Hipkins is quite a good heavy lifter. He's, he's a hard worker, and he's amongst a whole lot of flakes in that cabinet, but he is a hard worker. Yeah. But what they have done, and I find this fairly um, it's shame for what they've done, they've used that state of emergency and extended it down so they can monopolise the podium, monopolise the media. Now, every region, province, had the right to invoke a state of emergency and had the powers that go with it. This government chose to do it on a national basis when they clearly didn't need to, but they didn't then use the resources at their disposal, i.e. the defence forces, to solve the problems. So you can only conclude that they did it so they could get on the podium and have control of the media. And that's fairly average behaviour, in my view. It's yeah. cynical exploitation. That's a, that's a pretty behavior. good point, actually. Yeah, that's a really good point, Leo, because um, the national emergency is called so that they can marshal the national resources. It's not that the whole place is under a national emergency as such. It's around the resourcing. So people sort of get it a little bit wrong. Um, and, they, and, and I cannot understand how they haven't got just about every, every, every soldier who's not on active duty over, overseas should be um, in the, on the East Coast. As simple as that. And probably in areas in Auckland that have been um, badly affected in Auckland as well. It seemed to me to be really strange and it sort of goes to the heart of some of the stuff around the lawlessness and the possible um, crime um, that's sort of bubbling under the surface in those areas as well. Uh, so the response in some respects has been reasonable, but in others it's just like, hey, well, haven't you, didn't you just give Jerry a ring and ask him what, you know, the early days of Christchurch was textbook stuff in terms of the earthquake. And and they should have just given him a ring and said, give us some pointers, the 10 things we need to do on the first first 20 days and, and go and, and do that. And uh, uh, Jerry was really good the other day when I had him on air. He, he didn't politicise it and he sort of said what they needed to do. They need to enact the emergency legislation as fast as possible to give them the powers to be able to do all of the things to get everything in place much faster than they are at the moment. Because the wheels will fall off in the next couple of weeks. There is no doubt about that. As the, as the stress of, of, of what people are dealing with, the magnitude of it, and the wrecked lives that are going to come out of it. And this that will be when they, they are found wanting, I think. The inescapable fact is they did not mobilise the resources at their disposal. They did not help out. They just got in helicopters with high vests on them for photo opportunities. And, and TV crews. Really, yeah. OK, OK, it's I can so understand good. your cynicism, and, and, and I, I don't doubt there's an element of truth to what you say. All right, um, but do you think, do you think, and the question was, is Labor now perhaps back in the game in a meaningful way? Yeah, no doubt they're in the game. But having said that, Seymour was particularly strong at the moment. He's the one who's yeah, but he's only taking votes off the Nats. It's a redistribution on the right, Leo. Well, it doesn't really matter. True, but he stepped up and he stepped into a vacuum. And the question you've got to be asking yourself: Are the Nats holding back? Because Luxon doesn't appear to be. You know what? I don't get the feeling they are. I think that's it. I think that that that's all there is in the tank. If that's all there is, no, that's a bit of a worry. No. That's where Nick Willis might come into play. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't see how that. I, I I just don't get the feeling of leadership or, or, or boldness. I I get a feeling a guy's got a got a management it's book bloody, and a it's set of It's bloody difficult in a time like this, though, because if you do start picking at them, you look like you're um, politicising a, a disaster, and that's always a difficult yeah. difficult thing. But at the same time, you're there to advocate for the people, and I think Luxon's done that all right. Mike Mitchell's done a better job, actually. Um, well, there you go. And, and getting, he's a guy who might be leader. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, See, Mitch is, no, Mitch when I say that, I mean, him. he's done a, he's done a good job. I'm not yeah. saying he's done a better job than Luxon. Yeah. I think, you know, it's it's a it's a really tough place to find yourself in in terms of, of Luxon seat. It's the most unenviable place in in yeah. politics when you have a disaster like this and, and the government's all over it. All right. Guys, the next uh, topic, I want to raise the topic of this poem by uh, Tusiata Avia, Order of New Zealand, New Zealand Order of Merit recipient. A woman who's lived most of her life sucking on the public tit through Creative New Zealand or working at a university or, or arts grants funding. I want to ask you first before we can talk about it. I mean, have both of you read or heard the poem? Yes. Leo? Yes, definitely, and scrutinise it closely. 
All right. Uh, my view, I've read the adapted version as well, the one she just said for the art festival up here, so... Yeah. Uh, what do you think? What do you say, Leo? Well, I think it's, it's art, you know, it's, it's not to be taken literally, but any palm about a carload of chicks killing old white guys using gang street vernacular is pretty average in my view. I think it's a shit palm, to be frank with you. Um, I mean, it's not exactly yeah. Oscar Wilde, the, the ballad of Reading Jail, is it? You know, it's, it's a poor palm and it's a poor subject choice. If it weren't a, a poem, Leo, that. do you think it would, under the current law, be hate speech? Well, clearly hate speech, but at the end of the day, we have to look at it in context. It's an arts festival, it's a palm for an arts festival. It's not literal. Well, it's a palm yeah, and a book she's literal. already published, actually. It's only been adapted uh, for the arts festival. Yeah, well, I'm talking about the adapted Okay, version, are, you, are you happy that, that government funds almost entirely are being used to promulgate this, this poem? Well, I know you want to talk about Raoul Dahl today, so how much independence do you want to have in people's right for expression of mm. you know, poetry, literature? And that's why I know. put them both down there together. I was hoping one of you two would make the link. <laughs> <laughs> to be yeah, it, it, it just but gets a bit tricky. I'm indifferent to her poem, to be honest with you. I feel sorry for her. That's her command of English literature. She needs some help. The, as I said, the thing I find offensive about it is the clear use of gang vernacular, and we have enough issues going on with young gangsters in New Zealand now. Yeah. Tina, your thoughts? Uh, look, it's, it was like, a, oh, yeah, whatever. Because um, if you listen to this, some of the radio stations, it's a bloody worse, worse stuff on there. Um, and I, I just, it, to me, it was just like, oh, it's art, you know, it's a bit like the... Yeah, Madonna but I shouldn't have on. to pay for crap art like yeah, that. I, look, I t no, well, actually, you do. Because, you know, you don't get to decide what's art and what's I not. I do get art to and, decide what... I do get to, get decide, to decide what, what I what think is like. hate speech. No, you, no, no, no. Get, There's plenty of, uh, of wacky, whack job art... Um, that that is funded by the government that I that I might not agree with, but I don't find personally offensive, and doesn't create incitement for people to literally kill me. It didn't it didn't say you go out and join us. It just said this is what we're going to do. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't even I don't even think it's hate speech. Really? But, you know, I I I, I no. No, I don't, because it just didn't affect me that way. It didn't make well, me feel you're not like, a white oh, my guy. God. You're not a member of the minority. You're not a member of the minority that was targeted in that poem. White well, guys Well, yeah, like no, but I live with one, so yes. It, it, but it doesn't, it, it, to me, I was more, I'm more offended by the, the rape of, of Roald Dahl's work. Okay. I just find that appalling. But you notice that the French and European publishing houses are saying, get stuffed, we're not going to change his work, which I think is wonderful and tells yes. us something about the artistic culture of mainland Europe and the uptight wokeness of America and the United States. And does that mean we're going to go through all of the books in the library and take out the word nigger? Because I had this argument on the air the other day about how Māori frequently used the word nigger yeah. in their vernacular when they're talking with each other. Yeah. And I, I, use the, you know, I use the example of, and then a Pākehā comes in the pub and he's listening to all of the boys talk and thinks he's going to get involved and then starts using the word nigger and they turn around and call him a racist. And, now, and you're allowed to happens. use that word because you are Māori, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm allowed to use that word. <laughs> To, to describe a situation which I think is is just plain weird that we are accepting it and that actually Māori have to take it and anyone of colour has to take a really good look at themselves when they ask us to do things to a certain, you know, a, a, a normative level in society and yet they don't do that. It, it's like a double standard oh, to me. Can I get a word in here? This is like being married again, having to put up with you, Tina Nixon. I can't get a bloody word. <laughs> can I just say, I went to hear Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle during the week and talk about the N-word, which I won't use, by the way. I mean, every sentence was punctuated. He, he uses N-word more than I use the F-word. Mm. But it was good fun. It was good humour. And it was interesting to see the crowd there, a very interesting crowd. But I want to touch on this Ralph Dale thing, too. I mean, where does this end? Are we going to now go and... Uh, Merchant of Venice, going to go and rewrite that bit of Shakespeare? Are we going to rewrite, um, are we going to delete the art of Caravaggio? I mean, where does it end? That's the issue I've got. Once you start dabbling with, and it's yeah. a minor level dabbling. Look, it's you know, so much can't... easier just to burn the books. Why can't a person be fat, though? Why can't Raul Dahl say a person's fat? Yeah, it's or ugly, or slow, or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, it, and, and in some ways, I think Raul Dahl, by all accounts, was a real a-hole. Um and a drunkard and everything, and probably had PTSD. But part of, of the beauty uh, and the level on which his books were, they explore the idea of ugliness and how we respond to it and unhappiness. There's actually a huge amount of, I don't know, pathos and empathy in his works if you really read them as an adult. And to take away those words and things 
would be, to my mind, they are not Roald Dahl's books anymore. Are they? They're not. No. They're a story by Roald Dahl adapted by a bunch of woke mofos, really, Tina. Yeah, it, it, I, t I totally agree. And I, I was into Roald Dahl and Edgar Allan Poe and that at a very, very early age. I mean, I love that sort of, you know, yeah. quirky, horror, nasty, social social sort of yeah. look at life. And, um, yeah, so uh, but I just I just find that cancel culture and literature really stupid. We need to have, and that's why I, 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 I don't have an issue with the poem. For yeah. the same reason. Yeah. It's, it's good, it's bad, we don't yeah. agree with it. I don't, yeah. I don't mind, it. Look, I don't mind saying, her hey, writing it. it. I don't mind her reading it. I do object to me having to fund it. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, well, I'm happy to fund it because, as I said, I don't think it's a call to arms. It's just saying, "Hey, this is where we're really pissed, but the old whiteies and we're going to go out in the car and yeah. and, and Could um, I ask you, a look, I just want to check: Did Maori practice slavery and Pacific Islanders practice slavery before the white yeah. men arrived? Yes. Yeah. Ah, funny yeah. that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, but I didn't. On, hear it. No one them. had mentioned that. Te Shadi Avia is actually a, um, a, a Samoan of some yeah. extraction, of course. Uh, and, and they do have a rich history of being violated by the Tongans, in case you forgot. So she might want to write a poem about Tongans one day. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Let's start a real race war. Um, yeah. <laughs> look, guys, two other things, and we've got time for it. Jesus, it's been a good session, too. I thank you both very, very much, uh, indeed. Can I close, though, with the verse of the greatest poem ever written by Oscar Wilde? Oh, God. I, we're not going to close, but you can read it now. I've, I've blown away yeah. all my caution about people reading poem live on the, poems live on the radio. Go for it. If each man kills the things he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Nice. We both know where that come from. Yeah. Um, okay, Great. what are you guys going to put when you fill out your census next Tuesday on gender? Female. I think I'm pretty clear what I am. Ah, I said yes, okay, <laughs> no, no, but there's a question. There's a male-female question, and then is what gender you identify as. Female. Well, I'm going to go and write a poem now about the last raving heterosexual in, in New Zealand. Yeah, well, they're a bit frizzled, but I st they're a bit frizzled, but I've still got ovaries. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to get into that next week because I think that's going to be, be be a huge issue. And look, the other thing, this is my first world problem this week: Sky Television. And I only use Neon. That's the only Sky service I use now that I pay a subscription for. Sky Television are going to improve their customer experience from people by firing 90 call centre people in New Zealand and contracting out to an Indian company that will have 200 people for half the cost out of the Philippines uh, doing their customer servicing. Do either of you for a moment believe that it's going to improve the customer service experience for anyone who rings Sky Television? No. <laughs> Definitely not. What? Well, let me, let me tell you this. The, the shortage of labour supply is orchestrated in New Zealand, isn't it? So who do you yeah. blame? You know, the, yeah, the, yeah. the thing that gets pointed clearly back at one or two individuals in one particular party again, because that has been a plan that they have engaged in. But having said that, we've always had answering services for a multitude of different companies, multinational companies overseas based, and you're right, nothing gets done, but that's how it is. So. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not meant to be racist, but if you're going to solve my problem on the phone... For frick's sake, someone, have someone who I can understand and who can understand me, not someone who has English as a second language with a very bad accent. Um, have either of you got any random thoughts that you want to finish with today? Anything that's pumped your nads? Got your panties in a bunch this week? Just the well, I've got a day at Kapahaka today. I'm meeting, I'm meeting the mayor at Kapahaka for a couple of hours. I'm looking very much forward to that. Can I Thank just say, park. actually, about Kapahaka, mm. I, I'm not into it I, uh, and it's not part of my culture... Someone made a comment on Facebook about how we've spent $8 million on the ballet and $1.8 million on Kapahaka. Can I just say I think they've got a point? I think you can see ballet anywhere in the world. You can't see Kapahaka anywhere in the world. Yep, that is definitely one of those issues where the funding has not been a not, not been fairly um, um, shared. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a little graph floating around which shows very clearly... Um, uh, the disparity in that, and it's such a huge thing. It is so, it is so unique. And whether you, yeah. are, uh, you know, believe in Maori arts and craft or whatever, it is a spectacular event. Yeah, okay. And, and I uh, might even I get think, into it. Yeah. I might even get into it. I just don't like being propagandised into it, Tina. 
by state funded propaganda. You know me, I'm a contrarian. Leo, you're going with Wayne Brown to the to the Kapahaka. Well, not quite. I'm going with Nati Fatua, but I'm meeting Wayne now. I saw him last night for a beer. And yeah. um, I said, what up to tomorrow? And he said, I'm going to be at Kapahaka 10 to 12. So okay. I'm going to go meet him there. So he's got, the he's got a new PR person, has he? <laughs> he's been waiting for you to ring him. I've told okay, him. Okay, I'm going to ring, ring him this weekend. I'm going to tee up a chat with him. I want to do a Wednesday with Wayne is the idea. Um, yeah. Hey, guys, that was a really good session. I thank you both. Tina, I thank you for, look, a really interesting job. And you were exactly the right person at the right time this week to talk about the issues you raised. So, so good on you, sister. And as I said, don't forget to send me the bill. Leo, thank you for lunch on Tuesday. And I'll ring Wayne this weekend. And that was a hell of a good Free Speech Friday, guys. Go well and take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Leo. Bye. Leo Malloy, Tina Nixon, our uh, participants in this uh, week's uh, Free Speech Friday.